who are attending this very important lecture today. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Bina Agrawal for uh, accepting our request to deliver the lecture during this ICR uh, important lecture series uh, to commemorate the 75 years of India's independence. A very uh, noble cause for every Indian. Every Indian is proud of celebrating this 75 years of its independence. Uh, um, uh, Professor uh, Bin Agrawal, I want to just tell you that uh, in, under this platform, we had uh, 41 lectures till date, and today is the 42nd lecture. And the lectures have been by very eminent persons, uh, the chief economic advisor, uh, the many uh, international consultants, uh, international professors, uh, the and national uh, figures like Professor R.B. Singh, the secretaries of various departments, various ministers, and even the motivational lectures we also had, uh, like uh, by Pandit Ravi, by uh, C.C. Ravi Shankar, and uh, many more uh, uh, other such uh, leaders. So in the same series, uh, uh, we have a very important lecture today, uh, that is the rethinking the way we form in India. Very uh, interesting topic, which we have chosen, and a very interesting topic, I think, keeping in view the audience, uh, which include uh, the vice chancellors, which include the many uh, deputy director generals of ICR, senior persons uh, from the universities and ICR, and many persons uh, who have retired, uh, but they have been at the various key positions, so they are also attending. We have several other platforms through which the other audience, they are joining uh, this important lecture. So, uh, dear friends, I want to just give a brief uh, introduction about Professor Bina Agrawal. Uh, she is a Padmasri uh, awardee and very proud uh, for any uh, scientist to receive this Padmasri award. Uh, in the audience also, we have uh, the Padmasri uh, Padmasri awardees, you can see, uh, you can see Professor R.B. Singh is visible on the screen. Uh, professor Agrawal is the Professor of Development Economics and uh, Environment at the Global Development Institute, University of Manchester, United Kingdom, and was earlier Director and Professor at the Institute of Economic Growth, New Delhi. She has been President of the International Society for Ecological Economics, a president of the International Association for Feminist Economics and Vice President of the International Economic Association. She has held distinguished positions at many universities, including Harvard, Princeton, and Cambridge. She also holds honorary doctorate from the University of Antwerp and ISS The Hague. Madam Agrawal has published 96 academic papers and 13 books including the award-winning book, A Field of One's Own Gender and Land Rights in South Asia, which is published by the Cambridge University Press during 1994. Recent books include Gender and Green Governance and Gender Challenge, a three-volume compendium of her selected papers. Her pioneering work on gender and land rights and on environmental governance has had global impact she is currently working on group farming in Asia and Europe. Combining academic excellence with policy advocacy in 2005, she, had, uh, she led a successful civil society campaign for amending India's Hindu inheritance law to make it gender equal. Professor Agrawal's, Agrawal has won many awards, including, uh, as I told, a Pansi in 2008, several book prizes, the Leon Tief Prize 2010 for advancing the frontiers of economic thought, the Louis Malassis International Scientist Prize 2017 for an outstanding career in agriculture development, and the International Belgian Prize 2017 for challenging established premises in economics and the social sciences by using an innovative gender perspective. She is only the second woman from the Global South to win the Belgian Prize since its inception in 1961. Professor Agrawal, it's a proud moment for us to have you on this platform and to listen to you for 
this important talk, rethinking the way we farm in India. I hope uh, with your lecture, uh, we will be greatly benefited and uh, we will have a lot of uh, ideas the way we farm in India after listening to you. So over to you and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Bina Agarwal. Um, thank you very much, Professor uh, Agarwal, uh, Professor R.C. Agarwal, uh, for this very nice introduction. It's really a great honor to be invited to give this 42nd lecture in this series. Uh, and Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa, um, and to such a distinguished audience. Um, so I also want to thank uh, Amrit Patodi, uh, Arpit Pratodi and the ICR team for all the logistical support. Um, so um, I will uh, focus on rethinking uh, the baby farm. As I've said in the title, the idea is to rethink. Uh, we, no single person would have the answers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but with such a distinguished audience, all of whom are great experts, I think we might begin to move towards um, some solutions. So when we look at, um, I'll just put on my PPT and um, screen share. Can everybody see it, Dr. Agarwal? Yes. Um, yes, yes ma'am. Uh, so when we look at uh, agriculture today, um, we see a paradox because on the one hand, uh, it is the only sector in India's economy which has had a positive growth rate throughout the pandemic. Um, I remember in the first quarter of 2020, um, in fact, while the overall GDP con contracted by 23.9%, uh, agriculture grew at 3.4%, and it has uh, continued to be steadily positive. At the same time, as we look at the past decades, agricultural growth has come at a very high environmental cost, um, making it unsustainable as you know, going back to the 70s when we launched the Green Revolution. Agriculture today contributes only 15 to 16% of the GDP. The yields of our major crops are much below <clears throat> potential and um, yields of rice, for instance, um, fall below not only those of neighboring China, but also Bangladesh. And we know that climate change is speeding up. Some 86% of our farmers are small and marginal, and most of them are deeply unhappy and want to leave farming. So we need to ask, isn't it time that we rethought the way we farm? Now, <clears throat> smallholders, as we know, form the bedrock of our farming systems uh, and they face many challenges. One could broadly list them in terms of ecological, technological and institutional challenges. I've listed some, I'm sure many of you could think of additional ones. Ecologically, we see depleting water sources, degraded soils, declining biodiversity, all this under the shadow of climate change. Technologically, we are far behind in water conserving technology and climate resilient crops. And institutionally, we are still dependent on small individual family farms based on the exploitation of family labor. They have limited access to land, to inputs, to extension, to credit, and to markets. In fact, our extension services have greatly <clears throat> deteriorated over the decades. Also, I believe we have not taken enough um, advantage of agriculture's allied sectors, livestock, fisheries, and forests, or build the kind of synergy we could with the wider rural economy. So the question is, how do we change this? And I'd like to expand on four of these challenges <clears throat> before we can begin to discuss solutions. And as I said, no single person has the answer. Now, first, of course, is water, which we all recognize, which is key to higher production and yields. Even after second de decades of planning, um, only 49% of our cropped area is irrigated. Now, India uses 90% of its groundwater for irrigation and has been, as we know, it's been grossly over extracting. Now, Punjab is a very good example, a breadbasket. Now, water tables in Punjab have been falling um, from what I could glean um, by 2.6 feet per year since the year 2000. And by recent World Bank estimates, 65% of India's blocks will be over extracting groundwater by 2030. 
So where, you know, if you, rem- if you imagine that there were once Persian wheels which could draw water up you know, in the Punjab, today farmers now need increasingly deepening immersion pumps and in many areas it's hit our snake levels. Now, much of this uh, depletion, one could argue, is due to populist policies, particularly free electricity and zero penalties. So in the Punjab, I was looking at some of the figures that between 1997 and 2002, this led to a 40% decline in canal irrigation and a rise in groundwater use. And it seems that no state uh, other than West Bengal has metered groundwater. Now, groundwater, as we know, is a commons. It's a common pool resource. But richer farmers um, have been treating it as privacy and using um, immersion pumps, as I said, to overdraw. And we also need to know that surface water has not been uh, managed as it should have been. So we need regulation and not subsidies. Secondly, uh, we have um, soil degradation uh, and 37% of our geo area uh, suffers uh, from degraded soil and there are many causes of it. In fact, one important cause is water mismanagement in uh, poorly managed canal sites. Um, Soils have, um, you you see the soils are waterlogged, there's soil salinity and so on. And of course, there's monoculture and excessive use of chemicals, which are also contributory factors um, to declining soils. So uh, in the 70s, uh, I recall, you know, I'd done my doctoral dissertation in the late 70s in uh, on the Punjab. And I was and at that point, even you still found uh, fields with wheat and wheat and pulses. But uh, of course, those disappeared um, and pulses are nitrogen fixing. So this, all of this has vanished and we have moved to monoculture. And and then of course, uh, we have to consider climate change. All farmers are affected by this. Now, these are uh, some images, but, um, and there are many calculations on this. One of those was by the International Food Policy Research Institute, which gave a comparison of South Asia with other regions. And we can see that if you see these, you see that the um, sharpest fall in crop yields uh, of the main uh, crops are predicted to be in uh, South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa. And other studies um, uh, uh, give a similar uh, 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 trends. And then uh, we uh, need to consider uh, farm size. Now, 86% of our farmers, I've just put this small table here, 86% of our farmers cultivate two hectares or less. If you take these, if you add up these figures, 68 and 17, um, uh, and often these are in fragments and they occupy 50% of operated area. Mm -hmm. And what is also um, clear is that the marginal holdings have been increasing uh, and uh, the larger holdings have been all been uh, falling. Now, um, the uh, most uh, farms are too small um, uh, to use machinery and so on, um, prof- uh, uh, even machinery, et cetera, efficiently. 75 to 80 percent depend on informal credit. Um, our um, farm incomes are low and erratic. And while prices and markets are important, these small holders can only gain um, if they first produce um, a net surplus. So at present, 70% of farmers produce less than four to 5% of marketed surplus in wheat and rice. And these, this is uh, this um, IIMA report, which this is even in the, in the surplus states. Um, barely uh, an estimated six to 12% sell in mandis and only a small percentage therefore really gain by uh, minimum support prices. So it is perhaps therefore not surprising that many farmers say that they would rather have another job. So there was an NSSO uh, situation uh, assessment uh, survey, which asked farmers this question, do you really like farming? And some 50,000 farmers across India were asked this. 40% said they did not. So who were these farmers? A colleague and I analyzed uh, this and we found that this included both the poorer farmers who were, uh, who were very disadvantaged uh, in terms of inputs and outputs, and also the better off farmers who had other aspirations, and um, uh, especially younger ones with jobs. And um, young more than old and women more than men said that they did not like farming. 
And as we know, there's a growing percentage of our farmers are de facto uh, females as more men uh, than women uh, move to non-farm jobs. So um, clearly uh, the question is that these, um, these problems can't be solved only by tinkering with prices and markets and mandis. Uh, higher prices and market reforms, of course, can benefit smallholders, but we have to first address the problem of production constraints. And these constraints, as I'd mentioned, are ecological, technological, and institutional. So the key question is, can we farm differently, sustainably, and equitably? And I believe we can, if we rethink the way we farm and seek transformational change. And again, in all these aspects. So I'll give you um, some illustrations um, in potential directions. First, of course, I believe that we is need, what is needed is uh, an extension of irrigation and water conservation. We do know, everybody here would know in this audience that with irrigation expansion from the current merely about 49% of cropped area, we, uh, if we increase that, we would greatly increase yields, cropping intensity, and be able to grow more highly, uh, high, higher value uh, crops. But we can't do this simply by groundwater mining or just by building large dams. I believe we need a much more complex combination of groundwater regulation, rainwater harvesting, and micro irrigation. So, um, so the first thing, of course, is that we we need to rethink irrigation technology. Now, India, when I last did the count, had 5,200 dams and we keep adding to them. And we've always uh, treated dams with great reverence. You know, the, it was called, as you remember, the Bakra Nangal was called the Temple of Resurgent India. Um, but we know that dams today, we know enough that they come at very high environmental and human costs. Um, and we have uh, greatly neglected other surface irrigation works. And of course, an important one is rainwater harvesting. Now, rainwater catchments, of course, provide both surface irrigation and recharge groundwater. And India, we know, has a great, um, very ancient history of rainwater harvesting with these stunning architectural um, step wells. And some of these are hundreds of years old and are now being revived. But also what we see is that new systems are being created successfully in some regions. So here, is, uh, here are examples um, uh, of Johads which recharge wells, uh, and these can greatly increase um, output. So Gujarat is an illustrative example. Uh, between 1999 and 2009, Gujarat's agriculture grew at almost 9.6%, attributable to rainwater harvesting and Bt cotton. Now, over some 10 to 15 years, uh, Gujarat built 0.5 million microstructures, check dams, bunds, and so on. And this is really in contrast uh, to, say, Madhya Pradesh, which also grew in agriculture by almost 10% in more recent years, especially with the doubling of gross irrigated area from 24 to 43% in just under 15 years. But this was done mainly by mining groundwater and government canals and free power 24-7. Uh, so we need to ask which of these is sustainable. Uh, I might also mention um, that, um, that the surface irrigation uh, needs communities to cooperate in water sharing on who gets how much water and when. So in rivers and, can, and with canals, we need systems of distributing water equitably um, between upstream and downstream farmers, for instance, and again, we have a long uh, successful history of, of doing this. So here are some, um, we, we know in that there was the old Varabandi system in the Punjab, where it was government which was regulating here as a board. I got this picture of a Varabandi board, which told people when their turn would come, uh, but people still had to cooperate. And in South India, um, you know, you had tanks and you had um, uh, canals and you had complex systems of community cooperation. One of the early um, and most interesting descriptions of this is Robert Wade's book called Village Republics, where he looked at um, one of the systems in Andhra Pradesh. Now, of course, we know that we also need to use water efficiently. Now, this can range from drip irrigation to growing less water guzzling crops. Uh, 
Um, I found a 2014 government uh, study of from 13 states, which found that micro irrigation and especially drip irrigation reduced water and fertilizer use while raising wheat yields by 25% and vegetable yields by 52%. But only six to seven percent of India's crop area is under drip irrigation, micro irrigation, but particularly drip. Now, um, uh, we could argue that Narega can be used to build check dams and tanks, uh, but with uh, technical inputs on, on hydrological um, uh, engineering and so on. So this is one aspect, which is rethinking how we deliver irrigation water. The second shift needs to be in, in terms of cereal monocultures um, to crop diversity and agroecological farming. Now, um, I know there's been a lot of discussion in the, about this in India and globally. Broadly, we know what this means. That is, we need to cultivate to revive local ecology involving diverse natural practices and mixed, mixed cropping. And this would need to be both ecological and economically beneficial. It could revise soils, it could save costs, employ, employment, employ more labor, and increase um, net incomes and profits. What it would also involve is moving to diverse produce, poultry, crops, poultry, fruits, vegetables, which would also be in line with changing dietary um, patterns. Um, now, um, globally, I found a recent study where there were 57 countries. Um, they, they looked at uh, 286 projects with diverse experiments in sustainable farming and found the mean net increase um, of yields by 79%. Now, um, I think there is a cause for debate here. I know of the ICAR uh, studies, both earlier and the most recent one, which was discussed in the press, um, uh, on which looked at zero budget farming uh, to ask whether it increased yields. And what we see is, of course, we have to be quite cautious because it, it could have a negative effect on yields. Um, but also um, some ICAR studies uh, show that um, this can vary by crop and um, the, the question and, and then also what it does show is it raises farmers uh, profits because they save on input costs. So I won't get into the debate because there are enough people here who would be knowledgeable about this. But I think there's a general consensus that we need to move away from high chemical, um, high um, uh, in, in fossil energy use and, uh, and, and uh, kind of farming uh, to much more um, agroecological, much more naturalized, I would use the term, farming. And third, um, we need, uh, of course, research in heat resistant crops to deal with climate change. And of course, here is there is enormous scope for regional cooperation beyond India. Um, and the methods by which we deliver extension information. So uh, I saw a recent article in Science, which found that providing agricultural information via cell phones increased yields by 4% and the odds of adopting recommended inputs by 22% across um, a number of countries, including India. Of course, it would mean that small farmers and especially women farmers have access to smartphones. And fourth, and perhaps the most difficult, is the issue of smallholder disadvantages. The problem of small farm size. Is there an institutional solution to this? So I will talk more about this. Uh, what I want to mention is that there was a, there was a study by two American economists, uh, Andrew Foster uh, and Mark Rosenweig, um, who wrote a paper asking, are Indian farms too small? And their assessment for all India showed that an increase in farm size up to eight hectares, and especially up to two hectares, um, significantly increased per hectare profits. Now, we know that our farms are too small for even, even using machinery um, efficiently, for tapping economies of scale or providing farmers with bargaining powers with markets and governments. So how can we increase farm size? I believe an important way would be for smallholders to cooperate in production. Now, um, can smallholders become larger producers? Now, before I, I, um, I talk um, uh, about this, I do want to mention that the word cooperation has been used quite casually, so we need to be somewhat precise. Uh, I've elaborated this in several papers. I've been working on this for about 10 years, that cooperation in farming can be at many levels. It can range from single purpose to multi-purpose to fully integrated 
farming. Now, globally, um, a single purpose um, cooperation, which I call minimum single purpose cooperation, is quite a common. Um, they are marketing cooperatives, and it's particularly common in the dairy industry. In India, of course, Amul is a very good example. And then you can have medium purpose cooperation where you might jointly invest in irrigation. We have historical um, uh, work on this by Darling in the Punjab, for instance, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but we continue to see examples of that. You could have joint input purchase. You could have crop planning across ecological zones. Um, and of course, uh, there is medium level cooperation on soil conservation and rainwater harvesting. But I want to talk particularly also about fully integrated cooperation, which I call group farming. And what this means is um, collective production, pooling land and other labor and other resources and cooperating on a daily basis. Now, um, these are some pictures of different levels of cooperation. This is a, a picture of uh, Amul, a women taking um, you know, to the Amul dairy their milk, 3.6 million members. This is medium level where ecological planning is being done by the NGO Pradhan, but I'm sure by other institutions uh, and government institutions also. And this is ex examples of uh, group farming, which is fully integrated cooperation in Kerala and other states. Now, what would pooling land, labor, and capital um, yeah, and uh, sharing costs and benefits, what potential advantages uh, could this bring? Now, conceptually, and I must uh, mention that it will be small groups. This could improve economic viability and it could help uh, farmers not just create, uh, give them greater access to land, but bring economies of scale. Uh, with the, the labor sharing could be, they could be labor saving, particularly saving on hired labor bringing larger pool of funds and inputs, uh, bringing a greater diversity of skills than can be found by in one person or one family, and help experiment with risk-prone higher value crops with larger payoffs. Now, groups can also better deliver on contracts and have higher bargaining power uh, with governments and markets. And they are better positioned to take steps to deal with climate change. For women farmers, there would be additional benefits because groups can help overcome conservative social norms and give them greater um, mobility and autonomy in farm management. So you might say, well, all this is very good in theory. Uh, what about practice? Now, before I begin to talk about practice, I want to talk about deal with some issues of skepticism. So when I say, well, um, yeah, when I talk about group farming, uh, an immediate question that comes up um, is, well, uh, didn't we try cooperative farming in the 1960s and we failed? Um, so it won't work. Um, so it's true, uh, we, we did fail. Um, but then we have to ask, well, why did we fail? And I think we failed because we paid no attention to institutional design. Cooperatives were promoted uh, top down. You remember they were promoted, uh, particularly influenced by China, uh, the Chinese experience. Uh, Planning Commission tried it, you know, talked about it in the first plan, second plan, third plan, and then it gave up. Now, those cooperatives were promoted top down. They were structurally unequal. We misguidedly pushed large and small farmers into one cooperative without recognizing conflicts of interest and mistrust. And there were no clear mechanisms for participative decision-making, conflict resolution, and equal sharing of costs and benefits. In other words, they violated basic principles of successful cooperation, either due to commission or due to omission. For cooperation to work, we need institutional design and carefully. To begin with, it should be voluntary. The group should be small economically homogeneous, even if socially heterogeneous, there's something I'll come back to, and cemented on trust. We need participative decision-making, checks on free riding. Uh, this is ensuring, for instance, that everybody turns up for work if, you, if you're working in a group, and fair and transparent sharing of production costs and returns. Now, some of these we know um, are also common to um, cooperation around common pool resources. There were some principles which Eleanor Ostrom, the Nobel laureate, had laid out. Uh, but in private property uh, cooperation is much, much more challenging uh, and requires its own uh, particular principles. And these are some that I've culled out from the basis of my own work as well. 
Now, uh, the good news is that today there are many examples of group farming that follow these principles, both in India and in parts of Europe like France and Norway. Now in India, for example, in the early 2000s, there was a very different model of group farming emerged as compared to the 1960s, first in Kerala and Telangana, and more recently in other states. And some of these new approaches have adapted the self-help group model. So I want to talk about this. Uh, we see success. The best example of this is Kerala, and I have done detailed research on this. Um, in the early 2000s, Kerala, as part of Kudumshri, which is the anti-poverty mission, um, promoted all women groups, group enterprises, especially group farming. Now, what it did was it modified the SAG model to constitute village level neighborhood groups, which were saving and credit groups. And members of these groups could then uh, come together to form a group, en uh, group enterprise, especially group farming. Um, under this, some four to 10 women uh, came together to jointly cultivate leased in land, pooling labor and resources and sharing costs and returns. And they receive a, a startup grant, a technical training, and access to subsidized credit to NABAD, through NABAD, which of course is available to all farmers across the country. Today, there are 68,000 such farms across Kerala. Not a few, not 10, not 20, 68,000. And they involve over 3 lakh women across all 14 districts of Kerala. Now, as an economist, of course, uh, I ask this question, well, uh, how productive and profitable are these groups compared to individual family farms? So I did, um, to compare these, um, I, uh, uh, all, these are all women groups. So what I did was I did a sample survey to compare um, the women's, all women's group farms with individual family farms, which was again, small farmers, which were you know, largely male managed, 95% of them were male managed. And the survey was done in two districts of Kerala, Alapuza and Thishur over 2012 to 14. And the sample of 250 farms across two districts. And I collected weekly data with my research team for all inputs and outputs for an entire year, actually up to 13 months, as well as quality, qualitative and historical data on, or with focus group discussions. Now, just broadly, the average group size uh, in the sample was six. All the uh, women were literate, uh, many were past secondary school, and they were economically relatively homogeneous in terms of they were all disadvantaged, but they were heterogeneous by caste and religion. And this was interesting because um, a standard economic collective action theory argues that the more homogeneous you are, the better the chances of cooperation. But here what you find is social heterogeneity actually helped them because they had a larger capital, social capital base, and that helped them to lease in land. Remember, they depend on leased land. Now, the groups, um, average group, um, they cultivate one hectare, the individual uh, farms cultivate a third of that, about 0.35 hectares. Now, state uh, support somewhat leveled the playing field for the for women's groups because many of them had not managed farms, but not fully, because in particular, the women were dependent on leased in land, whereas the um, uh, uh, individual male farmers uh, had more that they cultivated. Uh, so there are a number of papers um, in, which if, uh, in which all this is detailed. Now, I, I used a very a straightforward model to look at productivity differences between group and individual farms and basic model where I compare the type of group and then control for um, input uses, um, cropping patterns, demographic factors, and, and district. So what did I find? Uh, I'll just share very, very few results with you just to give you an idea. Firstly, this is of course my uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the many regressions where you find that uh, a shift from individual to group farms was linked with a 30% increase in annual value of output per hectare. And then if you look at <clears throat> the results cross-sectionally without the controls, um, I found that the annual value of output of group farms was one point, this first uh, row, one, it was 1.8 times that of the small individual uh, farms. And groups were specially, uh, did specially well in banana cultivation. They entered into contracts with, for niche banana and so on. Uh, 
I also calculated the net returns uh, by deducting all paid out costs. And I found that the average net returns um, of the groups were five times of that of individual farms per farm and 1.6 times uh, that of individual farms per hectare. Groups uh, <clears throat> were, as I said, particularly able to uh, deliver on contracts. And these pictures are two, from two different group farms where they are, um, here you can see the banana being weighed. Now, apart from uh, <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the immediate uh, effects on productivity, um, you find that uh, the women learn to manage farms, to make production decisions and learn new technical skills. And this was very important. Um, they also uh, became familiar with a wide range of public institutions. Before joining the group, as some of them said, we had no contact with bank officials, agricultural officials, and government officials. And after registering as a group, they, uh, they became familiar with all of those institutions. And they were able to, they learned to negotiate in multiple markets, land markets, input markets, crop sale markets, and so on. They also developed strong identities as farmers. So they were no longer seen as farm wives and they learned um, their technical skills were actually then drawn upon by other farmers as well. <clears throat> and very important, all of this improved their status in the village and in the, in, within their families. Now, what is also interesting is through their various in, you know, enlargement of their, of their contacts and so on and their self-confidence, many of them have stood for village council elections and also won. So then you can ask, well, is group farming um, only relevant uh, for Kerala and is it only for women? And the answer is no to both. We also have examples of group farming in Telangana and new groups have emerged in Bihar, North Bengal and Gujarat, um, some of them influenced by, by my work. Now Telangana's group farms, for instance, are as old as, old, as, old as Kerala's launched in 2000 with UNDP support and operationalized by a <clears throat> local quasi NGO. And I, I also compared the productivity of group and individual farms in Telangana. Uh, in my study. So I found here that the groups uh, did worse than individual farms for the annual value of output, but they did equally well in net returns because they saved on hired labor. And they did well on a commercial crop like cotton. So, you know, I asked, well, why does Telangana do, not do as well as Kerala? And I found that there were some structural issues uh, which were very large group size. The institutional design wasn't well suited, limited state support, and an overemphasis on food grains. <clears throat> and this is, these were the disadvantages that they faced. Now the groups in Bihar and North Bengal, uh, small in number, but they're doing very well. And these include a range of types of groups, all women groups, but also all men groups and mixed gender groups. And some have pooled their own land, others have leased in land. Now, all these groups show an increase in yields compared to what they produced uh, when they were farming individually. And in some groups, uh, we see a doubling of wheat yields. Now, uh, this is due to a combination of irrigation uh, equipment and group formation. So you might say, well, it's probably irrigation which is driving it. The important thing is this would be misreading it because irrigation would not have been possible without groups forming and forming consolidated plots and the timely completion of operations and tasks. In other words, technology alone would not have brought the same benefits without group formation. Now, these groups have also gained through scale economies. Uh, they have saved on hired labor and input costs. And very interestingly, in Bihar, uh, they could, some of them are tenant farmers, so they could ne negotiate lower rents uh, as a group and challenge feudal relations, saying, we're not going to come every time you want us to do non-paid work in your family. Also, most noticeably, um, some youths have begun doing vegetable farming in groups in this area instead of migrating to cities. Now, again, uh, there are details of this in, in, in published papers uh, that I've done with colleagues. And <clears throat> finally, under COVID, group farms did better than individual farms. So in Kerala, of the 31,000 groups cultivating in March of 2020 under lockdown, 87% survived economically, especially vegetable farmers, whereas individual male farmers lost a lot of their produce because they couldn't find uh, harvest labor 
uh, and market access. And as with Kerala, so in Gujarat and, and Bihar, the farmers groups reported that they were more food secure during the COVID-19 lockdown than individual um, uh, farming, individuals, uh, smallholders farming in the same villages. So, so th I think these are, these are important factors. So what are the lessons we've learned on this? Firstly, that state support and NGO guidance is needed in, in initial stages. That group composition should be, that group should be small, six to 10 members. They should be economically homogeneous to the extent possible, but some degree of social heterogeneity can be helpful. The members would be connected through neighborhoods, so there is a degree of trust. And there should be egalitarian decision-making, labor and cost sharing. And the cropping patterns, uh, we tend to think that small farmers should just be producing food grains. So there's been a, 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 that, that this will increase food security. But in fact, the cropping patterns, we sh farmers should be doing commercial uh, farming. That's important without an overemphasis on food grains. And anyway, we, we are talking about more diversity in farming systems now. And then what's very important in uh, structurally and institutionally is to have autonomous federated structures. So, for instance, in Kerala, they connect their <clears throat> group farms were connected um, via autonomous community development societies. And this gave them strong negotiating power with the government. So here is a suggestion of scaling up uh, that um, you can have um, you can have self help neighborhood groups which do group farming uh, so you can have multiple group farms in a, in a, in an area but then they can be connected in a federated way at a, at a higher level at the panchayat level for instance or more and it's at this stage that if they formed farmers producers organizations um, uh, for marketing uh, that they could gain. Now, um, I know the term FPOs is being used in all kinds of ways uh, by people in the literature, uh, but typically they are for marketing. And um, uh, group farms can form FPOs, but ma joint marketing in itself can't solve the problems of production. So I think we need um, a, a mixture of both. Um, and small farmers um, need a base of group farming to produce the surplus, and then they could uh, form uh, an FPO uh, for marketing if they wish. Now, I'll uh, briefly now um, talk about, uh, so this is about the production part, but I do want to talk about beyond crop production is the allied sectors. We know that crop production is the heart of agriculture, but it's not the whole of it. So um, we should not forget that agriculture's allied sectors are livestock, fisheries, and forests, which account for 26%, 5.5%, and 8.5% of the gross value added from agriculture. Livestock um, is uh, poor centric, is women centric, and um, we have cooperative marketing around that, which should be promoted, <clears throat> but it has um, huge uh, potential. Um, uh, uh, further. But I think fisheries is perhaps we don't talk enough about fisheries because they provide 25% of the world's an, uh, animal protein. And over half of the fish consumed comes from aquaculture, which is in inland fisheries. Now, India has the world's second largest producer, uh, we are the second largest producer of ag aquaculture fish. And fisheries employ 13.5 million and 32% of the workers are women. So in 2017-18, which are the latest figures I could find, fisheries grew at 11.9%, which is huge. So there's a huge potential here for growth. And again, uh, you know, like self-help groups, this is an example of self-help groups um, uh, who, who've been doing fishery in neighborhood, um, you know, Bangladesh, again, you find a lot of uh, groups doing fisheries uh, very successfully. Then we come to forests, which is much more complex, of course, because forests are valued for multiple reasons for carbon sequestration. But forests, we must not forget, provide small farmers green manure, fodder, soil, water, firewood, and uncultivated food. You know, we're talking about wild food collection now, um, and and they come from forests. Now there is an estimate, broad estimate one could say by Thieb, which is the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, according to which forests and commons provide 47% of our GDP of the poor. It's a huge amount. And the GDP of the poor. Um, but we need to protect and revive forests. 
And here, community forestry, which India launched in 1990, has borne um, uh, great fruit. Our forest cover has increased uh, to 21.5% of our geo area. Our target is 33%. Um, and um, in, in my book, um, this is uh, the... This is a picture here, gender and green governance. I focus on this, uh, on uh, the improvements. And one of the striking things I found was that not only does community forestry um, is a success in increasing forest canopy cover, but we also um, find that if you include poor women in governance, uh, then uh, who have the most stake in forests, um, then it greatly and significantly increases canopy cover. Um, so um, uh, forest protection, plantation, biodiversity restoration can, of course, create hundreds of jobs. So to transform agriculture ecologically, technically, and institutionally, we would treat crops, livestock, fish, and forests as an integrated whole. But this transformation will need cooperation across smallholders and rural, rural communities. And finally, let's consider a major potential partner of farmers, the rural sector. Now, 61% of the income of uh, rural households comes from the non-farm sector, and we need to enlarge farm and non-farm linkages. Now, we know that the sector is very heterogeneous. It has food, garments, construction, etc. But again, there is a huge potential which is untapped. And I was thinking, of course, uh, we all know there's agro-processing, um, because rural families purchase something like 80% of food that they consume, largely from SMEs. And India also has, um, as I meant, you know, 6 million SAGs. Many are running group enterprises, but many more could do so, including, um, including agro-processing. Machine tools is another, if you remember, Ludhiana was a very fine example of one of our biggest rural hubs for machine tools and machinery. Um, and uh, with all the links, um, in a fast growing agriculture in the 1980s, but we need much more of that. And then I mentioned something which perhaps we haven't tapped, you know, farm tourism. Everybody knows about ecotourism, but farm tourism is quite common in Europe. And here farmers host uh, visits to, by school children, by tourists who want to see how farms work. So it also creates an energy in, in learning processes of, of children. So basically, therefore, we need to think transformationally, I believe, and not incrementally. Transforming agriculture in its allied sectors through a model of uh, um, cooperation and creating synergy with the non-farm rural economy could, I believe, invigorate rural communities and build back the economic and social fabric. Also, importantly, institutional and technical transformation of, uh, of farming would also help more rural youth find local jobs. They could live closer to their places of origin and not be forced to live like aliens in, in inhospitable cities. But for that, we do need both institutional and technological um, frameworks to attract them to see farming as not just a uh, putting your hands in the mud kind of occupation, but something which is both profitable and interesting. So basically we have an opportunity here to take another path to agrarian change, which is equitable and inclusive, which is ecologically sustainable, institutionally innovative and attractive to women and youth. And in all those, I, I believe a running thread would be cooperation, community and conservation. And to end, working in, working in groups could also make for happier farmers. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Bina Agrawal, for this illustrative talk and uh, for uh, talking about the three dimensions of uh, ecological, technological, and institutional uh, constraints and uh, giving a lot of uh, results of your uh, research work, of your analysis, which you have done by citing uh, many examples. Uh, we can have a few questions, if you uh, allow. And uh, they are... Uh, 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 there is one, one question. Convergence among the uh, land departments of agriculture, forest, fishery, and livestock is missing in West Bengal, uh, which resulted in poor and marginal farmers 
and they are suffering in the context of economic growth. So any... Sorry, what was the question? It is not clearly written. Yeah, so West Bengal, yeah. I'm not talking specifically about West Bengal. Uh, uh, what is the definition of community forestry? There is uh, here convergence among the departments. Okay, missing in West Bengal resulted in poor and marginal farmers. So what they are saying is that, uh, I think it's in support of what I'm saying that uh, this synergy was missing and they, they probably have experience in West Bengal. Um, this, is, uh, this is an NGO which is doing very intensive work in, uh, in West Bengal. Um, uh, and uh, they said that the synergy uh, was missing and therefore this is important. Um, and what then is uh, what is community forestry is a, is a question. Um, uh, and community forestry, um, you know, there are um, in the in the six seventies we had launched social forestry. Community forestry is different. So in nineteen ninety, in the in June of nineteen ninety, we. We, we um, uh, launched joint forest management and the recognition, the shift was that in the 70s, if you remember when the first satellite images of uh, were released, we found that our forest area was declining at a very rapid rate, um, that administratively an area was under forest, but in fact, um, there was very little canopy cover. So uh, there, was, um, uh, there was a shift in approach that local communities are not predators, they can be protectors. And that shift led to the launch of joint forest management um, in India and Nepal, and actually across uh, uh, partnerships in many Asian countries. Uh, and so um, what it means is that communities uh, come together and they um, form the rules of forest use, uh, the ways of protection and what can be withdrawn from them. And so they have a, a set of design principles. So suppose you take a, a set of villagers, they say this is a common pool resource and uh, we, they form a general body. So basically it's a two tier structure. There's a general body where all village households are members. And then there is an executive committee which can be anything from nine people to 15 people. Um, and the executive committee um, yeah, the, uh, then takes uh, broad decisions on what the rules of forest use would be. How would you protect them? Should you use a forest guard? Uh, should you um, do a petrol and sometimes a mix of both? Uh, and, uh, and then uh, those are ratified by the general body. Uh, and, and then what can be extracted? So for instance, firewood, they will say, okay, we can extract firewood twice a year or fodder. And there are many different rules so it is fascinating if you actually go from village to village and this was um, that you, they, each of each community has its own rules, but rules be, that have been arrived at a broad, by a broad consensus. So uh, uh, villagers who actually went in and broke, um, you know, stole from the forest or not stole, but they took what was necessary. Um, we find that they stopped doing that because if you are party to making the rules, you're less likely to break the rules. And they also prevented villagers, village, uh, other villagers from other, other villages to come in saying we are protecting this. So that made a huge difference. And in, in fact, uh, in, uh, we increased our forest area from 1990 to 2001 by 3.6 3 million hectares. So there's a huge, huge improvement. Thank you. Uh, there is a question. Is there any observation made on the in-depthness of Kudumsi uh, uh, members of Kela in your study? because the latest reports indicate high level of indebtedness on nearly 80%. Indebtedness, indebtedness. Indebtedness, yeah. You see, they, they borrow, um, uh, uh, they borrow uh, as a group uh, and uh, they borrow through NABAD as on subsidized credit and so do many other farmers. So uh, in, in, my, uh, in, in my analysis, I found that um, more than 80% of them were making net, were getting positive net returns. So there would be a certain proportion who may or may not. And I'm not sure that this, uh, this figure, uh, I have not seen this figure, whether this figure relates to group farming or whether it relates to all group enterprises. So I can't answer for Kudum Shri as a whole. And uh, Dr. Ramesh, uh, this Pandeji is asking, hmm. uh, Agriculture sector is much distorted in economic terms due to huge subsidies and yes. pre or low cost supply of water, energy, and credit. There are major reforms needed to make the sector 
market based and inter and uh, internationally competitive besides environmentally friendly any suggestion well it's a very i, I agree that we need to reduce uh, that uh, subsidies do distort uh, there's a general agreement on that but it really depends on where do you place the subsidies so for instance uh, the subsidized credit at nabard pro provides uh, is very broad and helpful but if you start subsidizing and saying we're going to give free power um, for irrigation uh, then it's obviously going to lead to overmining of groundwater so so i brought i broadly agree with you and i think the answers will depend on which particular um, sector or which particular input we are looking at we have we see uh, we have two hands up dr david uh, bhaskar and um, our, our vice chancellor who's there um, uh, Dr. Uh, Agarwal, but uh, we can take first uh, the the questions. Yes. Okay. And, okay. And some, right. some of the questions, not all. All right. Okay. Uh, there is a question by uh, Gopal Krishnan. Uh, he is complimenting you. Good perspective, ma'am. Is there any study on the risks involved along with the profitability for crops suggested as alternative alternatives for food crops, mainly and wheat? This is what is the, a general uh, a general question across India or what? Uh, uh, he is asking uh, with the with the respect to this wheat, uh, the alternatives suggested for the profitability. And my uh, so here's uh, here's the issue. It wasn't like something else against wheat. There is a general, much more global assumption uh, that. Uh, especially in the, uh, in the within civil society, that in order to increase food security, what you need uh, is to have farmers produce food crops. And uh, it was under this assumption that the Kerala experiment was carried out. Uh, sorry, the 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 uh, Telangana experiment was carried out. That the um, the group farms uh, were told that you should be growing food crops. So many of the uh, women said that we would have much rather grown cotton. And commercial farming, do commercial farming, because that given the absence of or, or limited irrigation, um, we are not doing well in food crops. They had no such constraint uh, in the case of uh, <clears throat> uh, in the case of Kerala. Uh, so the point I'm making is that uh, in any case, we need a diversity of crops, and to limit uh, uh, new experiments to food crops um, does not enable them to necessarily become food secure if their yields are low. So I think that's that's a general point. Thank you. Thank you. There's a there, there is a gentleman here who keeps uh, joining everything I write and keeps making all these weird comments. So I would ignore that. Yeah. And uh, there is a question uh, by Dr. David that based on the bipolar opinion about circular economy and use of artificial intelligence on the other side, how can a marginal farmer uh, take this for farming perspective? This is by Dr. David. He's working in uh, Rani Lakshmi Center. Okay. No, I think art artificial uh, intelligence is a is is a future which we, in which we can there is great potential, uh, and we can use it in many ways. Um, of course, in Europe, you find it's gone to an extreme because you have robots who even do milking, mm -hmm. um, and 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 so on. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in the Indian context, uh, ICR farmers and uh, Pusa Institute and others have been doing, and across the country, agricultural universities have been experimenting with this. Uh, and um, I think there's discussion of use of drone technology, for instance, um, to be able to map where something is wrong with crops. Uh, so I would like to hear more from the, uh, from the scientists who are non-social scientists on what the... Uh, you know, what the new uh, you know, what are the new emerging areas which even small farmers can take can, uh, can benefit from uh, dr rajesh is asking ma'am uh, gfm was only an executive program it did not give any secure territorial rights or community forestry hmm. under section 311 uh, of the yes. forest uh, rights act provides communities the right to manage their own community forest resources but the Forest Rights Act and the Community Resource Management Right in particular remain almost unimplemented without tenurial security yeah. that okay. provides community forestry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, um, 
I um, have a view on this, which is not necessarily the more popular view. Uh, and, uh, the joint forest management I've seen at close quarters. Uh, and uh, in 1998-99, I traveled across India for six months. It's rather unusual for economists to do that um, because uh, they don't necessarily go into the field. I traveled across seven states of India um, and uh, talked to, visited some 96 um, villages uh, and talked at length to, in each case, to the villagers to see how it was going. And um, I, I would say across from South India to North India, you found that community forestry was working. Now, um, there were a lot of complaints in 1998-99, especially from the women, because they had not been involved in the management of community forestry. They, they, and, and I think there were you know, some of my writings, there were also writings by other scholars like Madhusarin and so on, where the inclusion of women made a difference. But community forestry was not just an, a, a, an administrative order. Now, um, the Forest Rights Act was passed much later, I think around 2006. And Forest Rights Act uh, has its own logic, which is that tribal communities um, who have, may have been displaced uh, should have the rights and not be displaced from the, uh, from the forests in terms of the agricultural land that they were cultivating. Um, but in the community forestry was not limited only to tribal communities. In many cases, it was all caste groups. And so uh, I don't think uh, if uh, Forest Rights Act can substitute for the joint forest management um, uh, initiative. And I believe in some villages, especially in Gujarat, in some of the villages that I had done my research, the uh, Forest Rights Act um, led, uh, did not benefit uh, the tribals, but led to the undermining of the community forestry. Um, initiatives that had existed there. So I think we need to have a much closer look where it's possible to protect the rights of tribal communities without undermining pre-existing institutions like joint forest management. Um, and uh, and I, um, I, I think that kind of detailed study I have not seen, and there's much to be done in that respect. Uh, th thank you very much, Madam. Uh, there is a question by Director of Extension in Kerala Agricultural University. Uh, other than group farming and cooperatives, what do you say about marketing support to small farmers? Well, um, group farming, of course, is not about marketing in particular. It's about uh, dealing with production constraints that are faced if you're if you're a tiny half hectare farm. Um, but uh, yes, um, the one is that just forming the group, having enough surplus is going to help you um, uh, enter much better into marketing uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, but all farmers, whether they're doing group farming or not, if they produce a surplus, do need marketing support. So I'm not arguing it's either one or the other. Um, many of them sell at the farm gate. So if you actually look at uh, where farmers are selling, the small farmers are selling at the farm gate. And here we have to strengthen the value chains um, of, uh, for, the, for the small farmers. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, if you look at some of the studies which are emerging under co of how farmers dealt with COVID, you find that the individual farmers were not able to carry their produce under lockdown to the markets. And so they had to aggregate informally by say, asking their neighbors, could you take our produce because you have a truck between small and large farmers. I think um, a, a group approach in marketing would be very helpful. Amul is a very good example of that. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam, for the response. Uh, there is another question uh, by Vice Chancellor of one of the horticulture universities in Telangana. Uh, at present, no water scarcity is there in the Telangana. So uh, he's asking, can the farmers uh, go for diversified food, uh, horticulture, forestry crops? Well, uh, sir, the, um, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, VC, I haven't seen you. I can't see uh, your name. She, she, is the, she is the only uh, woman VC. vice chancellor. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, uh, I think there are parts of Telangana. I don't think Telangana has 100% irrigation. Uh, so there is water scarcity. And I would say that uh, uh, there are semi-arid uh, areas which have water scarcity. Um, and uh, But where there isn't, uh, then uh, definitely uh, they should go in for, um, 
diversify, I think diversification in general, whether it should be horticulture or forestry um, is an open question. It depends on the local ecology. Um, very small farmers hesitate to grow tree crops because then they, it, it produces shadows which you're not able to um, grow uh, um, other crops uh, in the shadow of tree crops. So um, yeah, I think uh, short-term tree, uh, tree crops, like um, you know, if you have fruit trees, uh, which are banana trees, for instance, a combination of banana or papaya and so on, um, you know, um, could be part of the diversification plan. And um, if you're in an agricultural university, ma'am, then you uh, would have some of the answers to this. Uh, I take the last question, uh, Dr. Malik. A more bending problem of farmers is marketing and in spite of good production, farmers are not getting remunerative prices. What may be the solution? Well, I tend to uh, take a different view as I've taken here. I think the most serious problems are the production problems of farmers. Uh, and once they produce a surplus, yes, uh, there are marketing issues as well. Um, but we have, I believe that we have focused too much on marketing alone and uh, deviated attention away from uh, the production issues. And therefore, what I wanted to do today was reorient our, uh, our uh, gaze uh, of all the scientists who are attending this talk and others to relook at how do we increase the productivity of, of uh, the small farmers and what kinds of uh, transformative approaches we can bring about in that respect. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Veena uh, Agrawal. Uh, may I request Dr. Suresh Paul, if he's there. Uh, yes. Dr. Suresh, can you unmute uh, Dr. Suresh Paul, please? Arvid? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Agrawal. First of all, let me uh, congratulate uh, Professor Bina Agrawal for really, I would say, the outstanding lecture. And as usual, her uh, lecture or any presentation is uh, based on her empirical work she has done uh, in the field, actually, not sitting like uh, most of the economists uh, do, uh, sitting in, let's say, their offices. And it's basically the primary work and looking at the, the self-help group in Kerala, looking at the, uh, uh, this joint forest management and all other issues which he has highlighted, they are uh, very, very important. And we can just uh, see some of the suggestion which he has made, look at, make them some kind of a location specific where these will work and where these will not work. I mean, we cannot have a kind of a uniform uh, yes. approach uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. It may work uh, for a particular sector. It may not work uh, for highly commercial agriculture. Maybe you require a different okay. approach. But some of the fundamental issues which he has raised, so they can be uh, put in practice. And particularly, I would like to, uh, I mean, say highlight here, the institutional change, actually. It is required everywhere when we talk about access of uh, uh, let's say the small farmers or marginal farmers to land productive resource or technology or credit or even market. So this kind of uh, institutional reforms they are very, very important. And there we need to uh, provide the uh, solution. That's for that. Thank you very much. But uh, honestly, I was expecting a little more on uh, Vinaji on gender issues some more because we have heard so many lectures. Uh, yeah, yeah. But because the time are, is the constraint, so. Yeah, so, but and, uh, I thought maybe Dr. Agrawal is uh, okay. directly discussing with you yes, yes, yes. because this is one topic where we didn't have uh, much, uh, I mean, say presentation or discussion, but certainly uh, we all have benefited from uh, your lecture. Thank you very much. Oh, we, we, we can have uh, yeah. a lecture on the gender issues. Uh, yeah, th th thank you. Well, you see the, um, uh, I wanted to focus um, uh, on a range of issues and especially on the institutional issue. Uh, and if you actually look at the empirical examples, the Kerala example, Telangana, you, what you've, and Gujarat, the group farms are typically all women group farms. And again, if you look at the SHG model, then um, most of the self-help groups uh, are women. Um, so I, I would like people who are working uh, across different fields 
uh, to integrate uh, the gender approach within uh, their analysis and within, uh, within policy. And so you can consider this as a lecture both uh, in, uh, on general and gendered. Yeah. If I could, if, if I could submit. Yes, yes, that exactly, you, exactly. You, you would do that. Yeah. Uh, there is a question which has come up several times. Uh, what do you think of natural farming? Well, you know, I uh, there are people. I think the general consensus, as I said, is that we need to move towards. Uh, low chemical, less chemical uh, farming. We need to move towards farming, which is much more um, soil uh, uh, conserving and uh, the, returning the soil, um, uh, the, the, all the nutrients which have gone without using chemical fertilizer. Uh, and, my, and so different people understand different degrees of natural farming. I think there is a concern that if you move straight away from um, the, uh, uh, the current state of high chemical farming directly into organic farming, you're going to, it's not going to be possible for people because it's going to reduce yields. And the, and the recent ICAR research also seems to emphasize that. But I think what's important is uh, that uh, we, we do a graded approach and move in that direction. And yes, uh, science is very much involved in that. So uh, the, the, there is probably much more micro science needed for natural farming. And it's probably easier to use, uh, use chemicals and show results um, than to do the kind of um, granular work which requires for us to return um, our soils to a good state and to conserve our water and other systems as well as lead to high productivity. And I think that's the big challenge for, uh, don't you think uh, Dr. Agarwal, that that's the big challenge, yeah. that uh, we reduce our, our dependence on, on uh, chemicals for fertilizer and pesticides, and yet have higher yields, as well as deal with climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for giving this topic, giving your thoughts about the way we can uh, use this group farming uh, and, uh, Ultimately, the way we have to rethink uh, for farming uh, to, to uh, cater to the all challenges, to cater to the needs of the, uh, the growing pop population and uh, to take uh, this new format, what, what you have suggested. Uh, today in the audience, as you see, we had a lot of uh, vice chancellors, a lot of uh, persons involved in this policy from the ICR. And even uh, we had uh, Dr. Kirat Parak, who was the member of the planning commission. He was also present uh, in, in the audience today. He's an old friend, yes. Yeah, yeah. He, he was there. And uh, then we have Professor Abhi Singh, Professor Gautam, uh, who, has, uh, who have given direction to this agriculture. And still they are involved, actively involved in this. And uh, many more persons. So I hope everybody has been greatly uh, benefited. And I request to the audience uh, that not to put uh, awkward questions, the, the word questions uh, by disturbing the uh, speaker. Repeatedly, somebody was- uh, Yeah, he's, uh, he's uh, like a troll. He, he joins everything I say and then, and then he, he does this. So I would ask so him to desist so, uh, so, so I, I request no, not to put uh, s such questions, please, because uh, the lectures uh, cannot fulfill the expectations of everybody. They are the general lectures, which has to uh, uh, cater to the needs which have uh, to fulfill the expectation of everybody. So those who are new to this field, those who are uh, not having much idea up to the policy. So everything has to be balanced and uh, that, that's what we have to uh, keep in mind. So anyway, I once again, thank you very much, madam, thank for you. accepting our request and uh, for uh, doing the justice with this topic. And I think uh, the, the debates can be on now for, uh, uh, for uh, taking the ideas which you have just floated uh, that how we can really go for these three kind of uh, reforms, the ecological, the technological, and the institutional, and how best we can have uh, all these points uh, into our policies. So thank you once again, uh, Professor Bina Agarwal, for giving your time. I know uh, you, you are you. so busy. No, it's a great pleasure and an honor. 
to uh, have had this opportunity to present some of my thoughts. And I'm now working on a book on cooperation, uh, which is a little more global uh, and would um, very much welcome uh, any insights that people may have on that subject. And uh, thanks to Dr. Suresh Pal for uh, introducing you to me that you can be a good speaker. So thank, thank you. you. Thank Namaste. you once again, everybody. Namaskar. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you.